that this meeting, thank you, Hannah, this meeting is going to be recorded. Um, and so we will share that recording and meeting summary online afterwards if you um, want to revisit anything or share with other folks. So um, I'm going to kick us off with a little overview of what Calm has been up to since our winter meeting in uh, February. And um, then we'll take it right into our presenters. So um, here's just what we're looking for today. We're going to hear about the Fox Point Beach Drive Coastal Resilience Project from Katie Summers and Scott Brandemeyer. Um, we're also going to hear from the Harbor District, um, and we have a slight change in our agenda. Brandon Cromody from NOAA wasn't able to make it today, but he did have some updates to share with us. And then we are going to be hearing from Jim Gillerano about the Wisconsin Coast Management Data Infrastructure Project. And we'll be wrapping up with a presentation from the Great Lakes Commission. Um, so this is what we're looking at here. We'll kind of have a, a mid-morning break um, in between some of those presentations. So I just like to kick off these meetings with a reminder of what we're doing as a network. Um, all of us are working together in this Lake Michigan region, trying to address those coastal hazards and build resilience regionally. And so our three main uh, goals for this network are to increase collaboration and capacity to address coastal hazards. Um, also, we want to develop, revise, and adopt ordinances, plans, and policies that incorporate resilience and tackle those hazards challenges. And finally, we want to regionally prioritize um, hazards to address through collaborative action. And um, I have a little update about number three at the end of the meeting that I'll share with you. But hopefully this just kind of grounds what we're doing in these meetings and um, helps us stay connected as a network. So last time we met, um, we got a little update about um, some of the resources that were available and kind of coming down the line. Um, and so I just want to remind folks that we have a really great resource hub um, called the Wisconsin Coastal Resilience uh, website. And I'm sure a lot of you have explored this site, but we've been adding um, lots of new uh, details to it and resources. So I just want to highlight a few of those. Um, if you haven't had the chance to check out the site, um, basically what you'll find on there is um, some basic background about coastal hazards. You'll have the opportunity to explore some tools and resources that um, can help you plan and prepare for hazards. Um, the tools and resources page just kind of points you to uh, some existing resource hubs. Um, there's also a planning specific page and with resources to help with planning and policy work. Um, so there's a lot of great resources on there. Um, we also have case studies. Um, we have case studies from the specifically the Lake Michigan region, but we also have some from around the Great Lakes in general, just really great peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities. Um, and some folks who are here on the call today have shared some things um, and we're, we're hoping to get more, continue to collect those case studies. Um, we also have profiles of organizations and networks that are working on coastal hazards in this region. Um, so if you're curious about kind of who's doing what, what their role is in um, hazards and resilience, there's a, a quick introduction to each of these organizations and networks to kind of help clarify that and point you in the right direction. We also have a blog and that's full of lots of great things, water level updates, um, meeting summaries, and guidance on risk reduction strategies. There's a handful of really, um, really cool guidance documents that came out of the Southeastern Wisconsin Coastal Resilience Project. And you can find those all there and, and more. Um, there's a, some blog posts talk about different coastal processes and seasonal conditions on Lake Michigan. 
And then finally, we um, have been working on funding opportunities. Um, you know, we heard from you all that funding is a barrier to um, getting the work done. And so we've been putting together some of those funding opportunities that would be available to help um, with that. And so I'm gonna highlight just two of the pages and let you know what we've been up to since, since February. The funding inventory is available and it's, it's up on the page. It's um, a, a collection of funding sources that can be used specifically for, for hazards and resilience work. Um, this, this inventory is searchable. Um, so you can look by organization, um, project types, el eligible project types, if you're looking specifically for planning or construction. Um, there's also uh, usually a, a typical award amount range that you can look by and um, match requirements as well. And then if you click on um, these kind of blue highlighted titles here, um, it will take you to a page with more information um, about that specific re uh, funding source. So we're really excited to share this with you and we're hoping to continue to um, update it as funding sources become available. But this is online um, already. And also on this funding opportunities page, um, we have additional funding sources that might be useful to use in tandem with the funding sources that are in the inventory. Um, so they're, uh, you know, like water quality, green stormwater infrastructure, um, data funding sources, things that might complement the, the other work that you'd be doing. Um, we also have case studies on this page and specifically how um, communities have used different funding sources to um, take a uh, basically implement their projects. And so um, we currently have one on there now and we have a couple in the works. So stay tuned for more of those case studies. And then there's a couple links to existing funding portals that have really broad reaching um, lists of funding sources. So if you really wanna get in um, and look through basically everything that's available, um, we've got a couple great funding portals linked on the bottom of the page. And so um, the other thing with the funding inventory that I, I just wanna highlight is those case studies. Like I said, we have one on there now. And basically these case studies are just meant to show you what types of funding sources were leveraged, the key lessons learned that the communities got from um, going through these funding and application processes, um, key partners who maybe helped them apply um, or, or implement the funding, and um, some of the, the logistics of perhaps using multiple funding sources or um, timelines for how long it took to really uh, get the funding and, and use the funding. So like I said, a couple more of those coming down the line. Um, so with that, I am going to be passing it off to our first um, speakers and really excited to be hearing from a couple different uh, resilience and climate adaptation projects that have leveraged different funding sources, um, some of which are in this funding inventory, um, such as the uh, NIFWIF uh, uh, National Coast Resilience Fund um, and some of the FEMA funding. So we'll really be able to see how those funding sources have been used. And with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and I will pass it off to um, Katie Summers and Scott Brandemeyer. Um, Katie is the Director of the Bureau of Policy and Grants for Wisconsin Emergency Management. And Scott is the Director of Public Works for the Village of Fox Point. And they're going to be presenting about the Fox Point Beach Resilience, uh, Fox Point Beach Drive Coastal Resilience Project. And um, that includes some updates on the project implementation and how federal grant funding was, was leveraged for this project. So thank you both for joining us and I will pass it off to you. Thanks, Lydia. Um, I'll get started here uh, sharing my screen. 
Let me know when you can see the presentation here. One second. All right, we can see it. Okay, excellent. Um, yep, so I'm Katie Summers. Uh, I used to be the hazard mitigation section supervisor at, here at Wisconsin Emergency Management. Um, and then Robin Fennig took over for that, but she recently departed. So I'm sort of the acting supervisor again. That's, that's why I'm uh, stepping into this presentation today. And I have I did work with Scott quite a bit on developing the project to begin with. So I'm gonna start off talking about that and the funding, uh, and then Scott will take over and talk more about the actual project and the implementation. Um, so what is mitigation? It's any action taken to reduce or eliminate the long-term risk to life and property. Um, it's important, this is FEMA's definition, it's important to know that they're really focused on life and property. They're not focused on open space or agricultural land. It's really structures, infrastructure, and human life. Um, it does break the disaster repair cycle. So as you can see, you know, you prepare, you have a disaster, you respond, recover, but if you don't, uh, make things better than they were before, you're just going to be impacted by the next disaster. Um, the, the value, uh, it has a great return on investment. Uh, for every dollar spent on mitigation, $6 is saved in future damages. Um, and that I have the link to the report that, that goes into detail on that too. Uh, FEMA does have four hazard mitigation programs that I'll go through briefly so that you can get an idea of what's out there for funding for type projects like this. The hazard mitigation grant program. This one's available after a disaster declaration somewhere in the state. Uh, it can be used for any hazards. So including flooding, coastal erosion, wind hazards, uh, wildfire. Uh, the funding's available statewide, not just in the declared disaster area. We get the funding uh, from FEMA, FEMA's um, Disaster Relief Fund, uh, which also funds the public and individual assistance programs. And the mitigation program gets 20% of that amount. Uh, the funding is 75% FEMA funds. And then uh, the state actually splits the 25% match. So WEM pays for 12.5% of the project. And then the local community is responsible for the remaining 12.5%. Again, this we only have after we have a federal disaster declaration. The Flood Mitigation Assistance Program is available annually. It's a national competition funded at an amount that's appropriated by Congress. Um, and it's really to benefit structures that have uh, flood insurance policies. So you can see the match amounts there again, 75, 25. But if it's a repetitive loss or severe repetitive loss property that we're mitigating, then the uh, match is less for the locals. The Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program, this is the newest one. This started in uh, federal fiscal year 2020. Um, it's an all hazards program as well, uh, an annual national competition, although we do get a set aside amount for our state. Um, and then the rest of the funds will be a national competition. It's also funded by the Disaster Relief Fund. Um, and it's calculated at 6% of the previous year's expenditure. So that's how much is supposed to go into it for the next year's BRIC program. Um, and it can, but it can change yearly. I know it says there's supposed to be an auto calculation, but if we have a year where we don't get many disasters nationwide, uh, Congress doesn't wanna see that fund dip too low. Uh, they wanna be funding these. So again, 75, 25 match. Um, unless it's an economically disadvantaged rural community, then you can go get a 90-10 match. Then finally, the pre-disaster mitigation program. This is actually a legacy program that was replaced by the BRIC program. The last year was uh, federal fiscal year 2019. Um, it was all hazards national competition as well. That's what uh, the Fox Point project was funded through. It actually got in the last year of funding, the, the fiscal year 19 funding. So that's the project we'll be talking about today. While this program was sunset, um, it is still funded through congressionally directed spending or earmarks um, occasionally. So we do have two projects this year that uh, one of our senators lobbied for and we received funding for that. So what does it take then to, to get your project funded? It's, it's a lot of work. It's, you know, you don't want to do this for, you know, a $2,000 project. It really won't be worth it. Um, FEMA front loads the application requirement. They need a full scope of work with accurate cost estimates that are docu well documented, engineering and design. Um, 
the next one, the benefit cost analysis and the environmental and historic preservation review are probably the hardest parts of the application and they take the longest and need the most documentation and the most work, um, especially for a project like this. Uh, the community also then has to commit to the non-federal cost share and it doesn't necessarily have to be local funds, it just can't be other federal funds. So um, it could be through a state grant program or a nonprofit could donate funds for that match or they can put in in kind. So matching with time and, and resources. Uh, the community has to be the applicant. They have to participate in the National Flood Insurance Program and they have to participate and in and adopt a local hazard mitigation plan, which are required to be updated every five years. So that's something to keep an eye on. If you have a community that's thinking about applying, make sure they're participating in a current local mitigation planning process. So um, we started thinking about this, as I'm sure you all know, there were really high water levels on the Great Lakes the past number of years, uh, and it contributed to really fast and dangerous erosion in a lot of areas. Um, a lot of spots that, you know, maybe they don't have a lot of development there. So there were a lot of projects that we were not able to fund um, because there wasn't enough at risk to make the project pass the benefit cost analysis. This project, however, um, it, it was right along a road that had utilities in it um, and it was eroding really, really fast. So what we had to demonstrate for the benefit cost analysis, we had to show the project cost estimate and then ongoing maintenance costs. Uh, we obtained an engineering report to show the estimated erosion rate and the impacts from that. Um, so how soon is this road gonna fail? How soon are the utilities gonna fail? Um, and then the estimated costs to replace the road and the utilities, as well as any structures that would be at risk. The cost of the loss of service for the water and wastewater that would be taken out uh, if the erosion continued. Uh, and FEMA has default values for that, but it's calculated by individual or household, you know, how many people are gonna be out of service and how long is it gonna be? So it's a daily value per household that you uh, calculate. And then also in this case, the loss of service of the road. Typically when um, we have loss of service of a road, they just calculate the detour route and the time it takes to, to drive on that detour route. So that's a valid calculation, but also this was a single access point for a lot of homes. So there really is no detour route. You just can't access your home. So how long these people are gonna be out of their homes to wait for the road to get repaired so they can access it again. Um, so, and the cost of them being out of their home, staying in a hotel, you know, things like that. So it really added up in this project. We got an excellent, uh, benefit cost ratio um, and knew we, we really wanted to move forward with this great project. So here's an example. This is a part of the engineering report. Um, it showed it took just in like 2019 and 2020, you can see the lines are showing how much erosion has happened. And then it, it estimates how much more erosion would happen in the next couple of years. And you can see that the road would be compromised within just a few years. So then the next um, hurdle was the environmental and historic preservation review. Uh, FEMA looks at things like, uh, are there wetlands in the area, endangered resources? Was there any previous contamination? Are there historic or cultural sites or structures that may be impacted? And then they look at environmental justice um, implications and public and required to do a public notice. So because this is on a Great Lake, there's a lot that they were looking at. And it was a really big project. Um, they did a full environmental assessment, but what they were finding because there were high lake levels all over the Great Lakes, they were getting a lot of projects like this coming through. So they actually used this project to initiate a programmatic environmental assessment for Great Lakes shoreline stabilization projects. Basically it streamlines parts of that environmental review for all of the projects that they were getting along the Great Lakes during this time. So that's kind of cool, it's in place. Um, here you can see this is a map of the shorelines that were covered in this programmatic environmental um, assessment. And it's basically um, all the Great Lakes shorelines in FEMA Region 5. So these are the six FEMA Region 5 states and FEMA Region 5 initiated this. So that's why you can see it kind of stops there on the Ohio border with Lake Erie. And there's a link to that uh, 
environmental assessment with supporting documents here as well. In case you do end up moving forward with a project like this, it's important to know that that resource is available. So the project approval then, we got it on September 9th, 2021. Um, really great project. They have two years to finish the project that are left in the performance period. We can get time extensions though, if needed. And I, we almost always get time extensions because of the way that their, um, their timeline, FEMA's grant timelines are structured. So um, yeah, there's the funding amounts that we were awarded, uh, you know, 1.6 million federal share. And then, uh, Fox Point contributing uh, over 500,000 there. Um, and here's just a design picture of what it's going to look like. And I'm sure Scott will go into more detail there. And then I do have our hazard mitigation contact information here for anyone who's uh, interested in finding out more about our programs. Now I'm going to turn it over to Scott and we'll be happy to take questions after Scott shares his presentation. Let me figure out how to unshare. There we go. Thanks, Katie. All right, Scott, Great. are you able to share? Yep. Perfect. Do you, see, uh, do you see my screen? Yes. yes. Let me move that over here. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Katie. And, uh, you know, you see this picture here is my introductory slide. Keep that in mind because that was taken um, while we were going through some of the design process. And off on the right, you can see uh, Beach Drive, a portion of Beach Drive and some of the homes that are there. And you can see some of the temporary stuff that we've done with, with the uh, concrete block. Um, so, hello. Let me get through here. There we go. So, you know, one of the things that we were looking at is what is the definition of coastal resiliency in the 21st century? And as Katie alluded to, uh, NOAA has says it means building the ability of a community to bounce back after hazardous events, such as hurricanes, coastal storms, and flooding, rather than simply reacting to impacts. Um, and University of North Carolina, mission of the Coastal Resilience Center of Excellence is to conduct research and education to enhance the resilience of the nation's people, infrastructure, economies, natural environment to the impacts of coastal hazards such as floods and hurricanes, including the effects of future trends. So this is part of what we're looking at. And there's a lot of other entities that look at coastal resilience nowadays because of all these impacts. And it's exacerbated by the population trends moving toward areas. Great Lakes are great because we have a lot of fresh water, uh, but then we're subject to all of these, the, the rising of the lake levels. So what, and I'm sorry if this is, I'm gonna get rid of that, there we go. Maybe you can see this better. So one of the things that we're looking at throughout the duration of this project, which started late 2019 and continues to today is what have our lake levels been? And it's interesting because I found this figure, uh, this drawing in our office dating back from 1860 to 1952, and it's showing the fluctuation of the lake levels throughout time. And down here in the lower right-hand corner, um, if you can see my cursor, you can see that the all-time high was in 1876 and 1886 at 583.4. It's interesting because um, in 1986, that's, that's reflected as the high level in the common era, which was 583.25, I believe. Here's another figure showing the fluctuation of the lakes. This one uh, shows it through 2020, from 1860 through 2020, with, with the average, uh, the mean annual long-term water level, which is around 579, shown in red. Uh, another figure showing the Great Lakes water levels, received this from the Army Corps of Engineers, the long-term average annual, again, showing it at about 579. That's the second, uh, second graph from the top. <clears throat> so you can see all those fluctuations. Well, what's the point in all that? And I'll get into that later, but it's really, how do we design for both the high lake levels and the local lake levels? And so I just thought I'd throw a couple other figures in here or uh, tables to show the 10 top highest average lake levels and the top 10 lowest. And, and it's interesting here because there's a half dozen of the top 10 highest average lake levels occurred in the 1800s. 
And the annual average, the highest was 2020 with 581.71, and the high point was July 582.22, um, where you can see in 1886, they showed as 582.25, and in um, 1986, 582.35, which was the high lake lows that we contended with at that time. And then the 10 top, top 10 lowest average lake levels, many of them occurred in the 1920s and 1930s. And frankly, can you say Dust Bowl in that time period? And the data that we've looked at, uh, you know, a lot of it refers to the Dust Bowl that was happening back in the day. So you had droughts going on during that time frame. So what was Fox Point's problem? Uh, you see the initial figure that I had provided. The shoreline was buttressed in the late 80s to early 90s, and that was in reaction to the lake level at 583. Again, we were experiencing low erosion along the shoreline, so our Department of Public Works accepted broken, broken and crushed concrete from surrounding road projects, street projects, uh, people who are demoing parking lots, etc. And we placed the concrete rubble along the shoreline. It was meant to stabilize the shoreline, and it worked fine until the lake levels began rising again throughout 2019. January 2019, the lake level was 580.09. In September, it had gone up almost two feet. And I'm getting a lot of phone calls from property owners along the shoreline saying, uh, have you seen what's going on? Of course we had and we've been monitoring it. Other than the concrete rubble, the shoreline was relatively unprotected. Our road abuts the shoreline for a total of about a half a mile. And the road is separated by approximately 20 to 30 feet of land between the road and the shoreline. We've got sanitary infrastructure immediately adjacent to the shoreline. I'll get into that in a minute storm sewer extending to the lake and water main across the street. So uh, we had a lot of debris washing up after the storms starting in October of 2019 and extending through January of 2020. And we were able to document up to seven feet of shoreline lost in a, just in a six week period. And Katie had shown one of the figures associated with that. So. What I'm showing you here is the 2015 aerial, and I think it's important to note this because you can see roughly where the lake is. Um, these aerials are generally flown by Milwaukee County in April. We want to do it with leaf off so you get a better idea of topography and uh, layout of, of the aerial. Uh, I don't have the water main turned on. The water main exists on the west side of the road in this location, but you can see in orange the storm sewers in this particular location, extending out toward the lake. The green line is our sanitary sewer main. Um, if you were to go back in time when the sanitary sewer was installed back in the 20s, there was about a 100-foot beach along the shoreline. And so it made perfect sense. Hey, we don't have to encroach on the road. It's less expensive. Let's go ahead and put it in along the shoreline. And they did this starting well south of here, which would be to the left of the screen, all the way to the north along the entire Beach Drive corridor. Uh, sanitary sewer main 20 feet deep, so they thought, okay, we're fine, we'll be protected, it'll work out really well. <clears throat> As time progressed, they eliminated, uh, they eliminated the sanitary sewer mains along the shoreline where there was private property or riparian owners abutting it, and only focused on it, keeping it in place where you have the public road such as this. But still, you are contending with a sanitary sewer main that's literally right next to the shoreline. So here's the 2015 aerial, and then I show you the 2018 aerial, relatively calm day from a water perspective, but you can see the concrete rubble in this area. Um, and if you can see my cursor, you'll be able to see this storm sewer pipe is a 54-inch diameter storm sewer. I've got some nice pictures coming up here shortly that'll show what we were contending with with respect to the storm. And then in 2020, bearing in mind that the 2020 aerial is roughly six months after all the storms that started in October of 19, 
and here's what you have. We had to go in and put in a temporary uh, protection for the shoreline because of all the erosion that we're experiencing along here. And again, I just focused on one area, Beach Drive. It's rough. It's about 1,600 feet long in the southern section, 800 feet long in the northern section. So you're about a half a mile worth of road that we've got to protect. And at that time in, in late 2019, when we submitted the application through Wisconsin Emergency Management to FEMA, we had no idea. Are the lake levels going to continue to rise? Are they going to drop again? So you have to plan for the worst. So what do we do? Um, when we started getting these storm events in October, I contacted one of our local consultants who does a lot of work for us. And I said to them, I want you to start surveying the shoreline after sto every storm event. And that, frankly, I think was one of the lifesavers that we had and that we provided to Wisconsin Emergency Management because it was clear, documentable evidence of how much land we were losing. And so, as Katie alluded to with the study, we're able to show that if the erosion continued, we'd continue to lose more land and it would start encroaching on the actual pavement area. So the survey started in mid-October, continued through December. We did additional surveys um, after the January 10th and 11th storm and into March and April of the following year. But these surveys were done prior to the submittal of the application to FEMA at the end of January 2020. So in a six-week period, we had documented that we lost up to seven feet of shoreline, and that's just in the 1,600 feet of the southern section. Uh, the northern section, we weren't surveying as much of it, and I'll get into that very shortly. Most of it was because it was uh, riparian owners, very goofy situation up there. So what did we do? We started scrambling. We was reached out to Wisconsin Sea Grant with Adam Beakley, Milwaukee County Office of Emergency Management. We had a lot of resident questions coming in and concerns about the integrity of the road, them being able to access their homes, what's going to happen. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers put on a presentation, and then we began working with uh, Wisconsin Emergency Management on the FEMA grant. Uh, and that was, frankly, we condensed a lot of work into, and Katie can, can um, attest to this, we squeezed a lot of work into really a two-month period of time because as we started developing this, it was early December and we had to have the application in by end of January. There was a lot, a lot of work. All right. Well, while we give Scott a chance to come back, um, we can take a, a little pause from his presentation and see if there were any questions for what Katie started us on. Any questions related to Wisconsin Emergency Management, the grants that she mentioned, um, the process for getting this pre-disaster mitigation grant? I have, I have one for you, Katie. This is Adam Beckley from Wisconsin Sea Grant. So you kind of mentioned when, when the benefit cost analysis was done for, for this project, you know, there's a lot of things working in its favor for that benefit cost analysis to come out pretty, pretty rosy for funding. Um, the one way in, one way out roads and things like that, obviously bad for the residents, but you know, good for, for getting a good benefit cost analysis. Is that, what about a more like typical situation? Maybe if this road was just going along the shoreline, it wasn't that one way in, one way out. Would that have been as workable with the FEMA funding or was this sort of a, a more unique situation? Yeah, Adam, that's a great, yeah, that's a great question. Um, we've definitely had projects come through that we just weren't able to fund, you know, like, so this is about, you know, a little over $2 million project, right? If, for example, we were saving just a road that maybe the detour is four blocks, right? And there's no structures at risk and there was no, you know, water and wastewater underneath the road, no other utilities there, that probably wouldn't pass a BCA. We've had a lot of them where like in uh, Kenosha County area um, 
and Mount Pleasant where those homes are, are falling off cliffs, as I'm sure you're familiar with. And those we can't, even though the home is going to be gone, we, we're not able to fund uh, a, a project because the projects to reinforce the shoreline there, because it's usually pretty high cliffs, are very expensive. And if the home is worth, you know, $300,000, you know, FEMA says, well, we can do a project to acquire the home at, you know, a fair market value as if it were not about to fall off a cliff and they could go live somewhere else, but we can't do one to reinforce that shoreline because it's too expensive. It won't pass the benefit cost analysis. So yeah, it was definitely the two, the two big things in this one were the utilities under the road and then the single access point for those homes. So though that really pushed it up into a, a hugely positive benefit cost uh, ratio there. So that's a great question. It, they are really difficult. We get a lot of questions in too about uh, projects to protect parks and trails and things like that. And we just, we can't even take into it. We're not allowed to take into account, you know, the, the preservation of, let me, rephrase a little backpedal a little we are allowed to take into account certain environmental benefits now um but generally not just protecting a park for the park's sake you know if it's like a wetland or a riparian area or something like that we may be able to use some environmental benefits um and that's a that's a relatively new thing that that fema's allowing um but yeah so typically the projects are going to be for you know, serious amounts of structures or infrastructure for human life. So good question. Thank you. Is Scott hey, back? Is Scott. Yeah, I'm uh, back. I'm sorry. I, I got disconnected. Can you still see my screen? Yes, we can still see your screen and we can hear you much All better. Right. I, yeah, and I apologize for that. So I'll continue with this. And I, I heard Katie's uh, response to Adam's question and I'll continue here. So uh, what we Thank ended you. up doing we hired an engineer to provide the short-term solution. You saw that on the cover slide. And they recommended placement of two by two by six foot concrete block. <clears throat> Again, the initial placement was along the Southern stretch where the road was closest to the shore. After the December storms, we needed to add a second layer along the entire Southern stretch. So initially it was just one layer of two by two block, uh, but in two different locations, one in front, one in back separated by about six feet to break up the storm. But the December storms and the January storm, you realize, holy crap, that's not going to be enough. So we added a second layer of block in the back row to make it four foot tall. And then in 2020, we placed block along the northern stretch. And then the FEMA grant that we were working on, we had to document the injury or impacts. And as Katie noted, it, it, you know, you had homes falling into the lake in Kenosha County you got parks, and what we had was all this infrastructure. You had sanitary water. Uh, we were able to show gas main and electric along those areas as well. And as you noted, there's one way in and out for beach drives. So if you lose the road, residents have absolutely no other way to access their homes. But then we had to gather more data on estimated cost impacts, current potential damages. Lots of data that had to be gathered. So Katie showed this picture. Uh, and you can see you got red and fuchsia, different colors here. You can see the October 14, 2019 survey data is in red, May 4th, 2020. Well, it doesn't seem to do it justice and it doesn't seem to be a lot. We could definitely, you could definitely see some erosion happening along the shoreline between October of 2019 and May of 2020. Now I've got some pictures to show what's going on during these storm events. Um, you can see all the concrete rubble along the shoreline. And this is already after other wind and wave action had been pounding the shoreline. Some of the trees that we had along here starting to lean and fall into the lake. Um, and I thought I had some videos here. They might have disappeared. I apologize. Um, here we go. Here's a video. So I really like this video. I've got two short videos here if you bear with me. Excuse my fingers that get in the way. Hey, 
And right there in that portion of the video, you can see how much driftwood we've gotten and what would happen, how far up the shoreline it was was pounding us. And this was, you know, I'd show the picture of this little tree that was starting to lean into the lake. Got another video in this next one. We had some concrete block in the lake already. This was to protect a storm sewer that we have here, a 12 or 15 inch storm sewer. You can't even see the storm sewer because it's completely buried with with sand and, and uh, pebbles from the lot, from the lake. And just throwing all sorts of debris up onto the shoreline, um, we were able to show, and I've got some additional pictures, some school kids, the impacts, and it would pick up 50 to 100 pound pieces of concrete rubble and land and stone and toss them onto the road 20, 25 feet away. It was really something else to see, and you're sitting there think, thinking, okay, I went into this job thinking I'd be wor working on public work storm sanitary roads, never once imagining I'd have to become a coastal engineer in a month and a half. So it was, it was a fascinating project, it continues to be a fascinating project, but you, you look at what the lake is doing and you think to yourself, how do we respond? So um, part of the problem that we have, and I, I like this picture because this is what we had around a sanitary manhole. And this is the October 21st storm event that we were experiencing. And as it showed, the sanitary sewer main along the shoreline, our manholes, of course, pop up out of there. This manhole in particular was just getting beat to death. Um, <clears throat> we had protection around it with the two by two blocks, but it wasn't enough because in the next, next picture, you can see right here, the top section, uh, the chimney section, was shifted off its moorings a good inch, even though we have these concrete block around it. Um, just with the debris that was washing up, it just banged it hard enough that it was able to shift it. And we're sitting back thinking, if that is knocked completely off and you get these waves coming up over the top, it'll start to wash into the sanitary sewer main and then everybody's dealing with basement backups down there. So that was another instance where we were able to say that is a very real and present danger to every one of the homes along Beach Drive. This is the 54-inch outfall that I mentioned. You can see there's large pieces, pieces of concrete rubble that never existed around this outfall location, and it was just pushing it up in there. And the next one shows it even better. This 54-inch was full filled halfway with all of these pebbles and stones from the lake. And you think, okay, how's the storm water going to get out? Now, the good thing is this drains 1.1 square miles of the 2.8 square mile village. So you get a lot of water rushing out, but um, we weren't as fortunate with all of the other storm sewers that we have along here, the 12 to 18 inch storm sewers. They were plugged full. And in May of 2020, we actually had to rip them out of the ground, cut them back about 15 feet, and just let them run out to the ground because they were so plugged with these stones that we couldn't even jet them clean. clean. Uh, here's another picture, another sanitary manhole that you can see right here with driftwood around it. And so we're still looking at things saying, okay, what are we gonna do? Again, another picture, you can see how, this is how far up it was washing everything. You're a few feet from the road in this location. Um, <clears throat> another sanitary manhole being impacted. So you're looking at these things saying, yeah, you might have good seals on them, it might be bolted down, but God only knows what, what the lake is gonna do. Here's another picture in December showing more washed up tires, driftwood, and this one was it, the December storm actually took stuff across the road um, over to the west side of the road here. We had to bring our plows down just to plow and, and front end loader just to move everything off the road over to the other, other side of the road. It was just an absolute mess. <clears throat> so here we are December 12th, 2019 um, with a temporary solution, short term solution. We buttressed this manhole that I showed earlier with additional concrete block so that if the waves were coming up, it would 
batter these block and not any of the ones in front of it or the manhole structure itself. Here's our contractor doing some of the placement of the block and you can see you got one row in front, another row in back, and then we had to add a second one on top in order to keep the waves from washing over the top. What we're finding, particularly in the January storm event, those waves washed up over the top and it washed some of these concrete block, which weighed 3,300 pounds, back down into the lake. It was just an absolute nightmare. Here's the January 10th and 11th storm. Um, again, lots of driftwood, lots of problems. Even though we had a short-term solution, we needed to buttress it a little bit more. So here you are, 10th and 11th. You can see what's happening with all those waves coming up over the top. So what do we do next? Post grant submittal, FEMA grant notified in late 2020 that we'd received it. We had to submit the supplemental information to WEM and FEMA through early 2021. Uh, before FEMA had officially approved it, we hired MSA to finalize the design. We received official approval to proceed in September of 21 and have 24 months to complete the design and construction. Uh, design factors, again, as I mentioned before, we wanted to design the system to be compatible with fluctuating lake levels. Record high 86, 582.35. You can see where we are at in 20 and 22. And now here we are in April of 23, 579.27. So we're three feet lower already than what we were just three years ago but you want to be able to account for those fluctuations. And so MSA's design minimizes the height of the revetment, but maximizes the slope in order to attempt to gain back what was lost from 2019 to 2020. So we had a number of options that MSA and Anchor QEA had presented to us. Anywhere from design slope, as you can see on the upper left, from one and a half to one up to a five to one. And the reason why we evaluated all those different uh, slopes and height of the armor stone is because, frankly, the people pay a lot of money to live down on Beach Drive, and uh, folks have sight distances. So if we were to go with a one and a half to one to slope, you can see here in the lower right-hand corner, the apron elevation would be at roughly 594. That's about four feet above the current road elevation. And we suspected that a lot of residents would be raising holy heck saying, wait a minute, now you've impacted my property values by incorporating an armor stone in a revetment that's so high, we don't get the enjoyment of the lake and that's why we paid all this money to live down here. And I understand that may sound like first world problems, but these are all the things that we have to balance. So, Eventually, the DNR agreed to a three to one slope, which allowed us to put that armor stone at about an elevation of initially thought to be 592, but what we were able to do is extend it out a little bit further to drop that elevation down to about an elevation of 590, where the road is right now. Um, here's a schematic of the finalized design. Uh, and in conversations with the DNR, what took quite a bit of time was where we could start this slope. Initially, we thought the toe had to start at the ordinary high water mark and work back, uh, but then the DNR confirmed that we'd be able to start the crest of the slope at the ordinary high water mark and work down into the lake. Once we resolved that issue, things went fairly well with the design and finalizing the design. Uh, here's another cross section showing uh, particular location. And <clears throat> so now you have what the design is going to look like on top, a cross sectional view. Uh, residents petitioned the village not to incorporate the path per se along there. We'll still have something where folks will be able to walk there, walk along, but we did incorporate in this area uh, perennial plantings because we wanted to establish deeper root depths in here rather than just all trees and grasses. Uh, so we're going to have some perennial plantings on the back side of the armor stone uh, to make it visually appealing. Um, and then Scott, again, can, you can see one. 
I'm gonna jump in here and just give you a one minute warning to make sure that we get time for a break. Oh, sure, yep, sorry. So no here's, problem. A picture, here's a picture of construction going on. This is literally from two days ago. They have to remove all this old concrete rubble and um, they've got two machines operating. One is a long reach placing the stone and the other one is prepping the, uh, the subgrade. And here's a picture of what's in place right now. So real quickly, the lessons learned. DNR and Army Corps permitting took longer than anticipated. We've got some riparian owners that may be challenging to work with. Communication is key to the successful project. And revisit your cost estimate, because when we submitted this to WEM in January of 2020, it was a $2.2 million cost estimate. As we all know, in March of 2020, the world practically shut down. 2021, inflation, labor market, supply chain issues, fuel increases. Cost estimate in 22 was at four and a half million. Bid came in at 3.6 to 6.1. We had no opportunity to revise the cost estimate because the one that we submitted in January of 20 was locked in. So that's the lesson learned. Revisit that, look at the costs, anticipate additional costs that might arise. So I apologize for going so long and for me being disconnected. If there's any questions, feel free to fire away. Yes, and we'll take uh, just a couple minute break. Why doesn't everyone plan to be back at 1056? And um, in that time, if you guys have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat and we'll get, see if Katie and um, Scott can't answer a few of those for you um, in the meantime. So we'll see you all back here at 1056. Thank you both for this presentation. Um, very exciting to hear what's going on with the project and, and the process that you went through. So thank you so much. And um, we'll see you in a few minutes. Yeah. We're going to be, thanks Hannah. Um, so we're gonna get started with our next presentation. We're gonna be hearing from Aaron Zaleski from the Harbor District in Milwaukee. He's the environmental director there and um, he works to help them in, improve local habitat, green infrastructure practices and, and water quality there at the district. And so today he's gonna to be sharing about how um, the district has leveraged some National Fish and Wildlife Foundation funds to support on the ground projects. So I'm gonna pass it off to Aaron and take it away. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, let me, is everything good? Can you hear me? Can you see? I can, I can hear you and it looks like you're just about to put your, yep, you're in presentation mode. Okay. Great, thanks. I'm Aaron Zaleski with the Harbor District. We are a nonprofit in Milwaukee. Um, so uh, presenting today about a project that's just in its infancy, our eco breakwater, ecological breakwater, um, and uh, kind of how we got to this point. So not quite as technical and, and detailed, but it's more about process right now. I'm gonna hit this arrow thing. Yeah, so the Harbor District, this is kind of our area. As a nonprofit, we're kind of looking at the redevelopment of this. Our mission is, in addition to the environmental work that I do, um, also concerned with the, the social and economic health and success of this part of the city. So with this uh, originally was like many of our coastal communities an estuary uh, with a large marsh complex and developed really quickly, was filled in, has been an engine of the economy for a long time in the area. And, uh, you know, in the past couple decades, the foundries, the tanneries, all that industry, some of it is still here, but to a much smaller extent than it used to be. So our organization, um, some of the challenges to redevelopment, obviously brownfields, that sort of legacy contamination, uh, old and aging infrastructure, relics of, of past uses. Uh, so our, our initiative kind of got started with the city the Redevelopment Authority, the um, Department of City Development, the Port of Milwaukee, and community partners, some of them doing environmental work upstream on the Kinnikinnick River, which goes through our area, uh, down to the estuary, thinking about what's gonna happen here. Some of the adjacent areas had redeveloped very successfully, and this was sort of poised to be next. So we wanted to have a community voice in that process, a thoughtful redevelopment that is going to be inclusive of goals other than just 
you know, developers and tax base and those sort of economic drivers. So to, to really get started on what that looked like, obviously I just said what we didn't want to happen with the redevelopment, um, but to have aspirational uh, goals and, and thinking about what catalytic projects could do. In 2015, we, along with the city, hosted our uh, waterfront innovation charrette. So this gave us some, some cool ideas. This picture is gonna be in a couple slides in a row here, I think. Um, this charrette involved four interdisciplinary teams. So they were made up of architects, landscape architects, urban planners, some, some involved you know, restoration ecologists. Uh, we had a competitive process to bring in these four teams with you know, requests for qualifications. They got a small stipend. This was a two-day workshop where members of the community were invited, stakeholders were invited to kind of working sessions. Um, where feedback was included. These teams summarized their um, concepts, essentially some of them as detailed as what you can do to a steel sheet pile dock wall to, to encourage wetland habitat to grow behind and others kind of much, much bigger picture. So this, this gave us a report of a suite of, you know, projects that we could develop and, and shoot for and some aspirational goals. This report is should be available on our website and the city of Milwaukee's website. Um, this was one of the teams that was led by an architecture firm from Chicago. Obviously, very aspirational. A lot of some of this land has redeveloped and isn't doesn't look anything like this. Uh, but for our purposes, number eleven up in the right hand corner is this concept of expanding our. Army Corps of Engineers breakwater structures into green habitat. And I remember seeing this, this rendering when it came out in 2015, and I wasn't with the Harbor District yet and thinking, wow, that looks cool, but geez, that looks, that's a really audacious kind of kind of goal and, and project. They, the group uh, produced this, this watercolor, typical cross section. Um, and this sort of, you know, more broad site plan with uh, restored wetland in behind the existing breakwaters. This is a page from the, the design report, um, which kind of summarizes the idea, again, the same drawings, looking at Cat Island in Green Bay as a, a inspiration for this project. Obviously, different context. This was all very conceptual, very aspirational at this point in 2015. So that, that plan kind of sat on a shelf. It informed our water and land use plan, which was adopted by the city in 2019, that set some goals for environmental transformation, as well as you know, some zoning. And, and that was adopted by the city as the comprehensive plan. These concepts fed into our Riverwalk design guidelines, which were adopted shortly after. Uh, this part of the city doesn't really have much public access to the waterfront because of its industrial history. So we worked with the city to put in place the framework to build out Riverwalk um, in this part of the city as properties develop. There's been one or two that are complete and four or five properties in various states of design and, uh, you know, in progress that will be coming online. We have design guidelines that, that, uh, state that developers need to include some ecological enhancements. So some of those, those there's sort of a menu of concepts that we're trying out as projects come online, seeing what works. And some of that was, um, came out of that design threat. So that was a useful process for us to get started. Fast forward to uh, about a year and a half ago, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation has the National Coastal Resilience Fund grant program, which looks for projects that both address coastal resilience and include nature-based solutions, include um, incorporating ecological improvements. I had worked with NIFWF on some other grant uh, programs that they have, Sustain Our Great Lakes, which is more straightforward restoration and green infrastructure. We've had a couple of successful grants from them. Um, but not, not really touched this one before. So this request for proposals came out and not a lot fit. You know, this is, this is a pretty big scale grant, 200, well, within, within my world, about 200,000 to a million dollars per award. 
They have a nice pipeline that sort of goes from concept planning to construction of four different phases. So it's a really thought out grant program. And I, I dug up these watercolor drawings, um, looked around our port, and this is this kind of gives an idea of what we're working with out there. So the yellow sections and the red section are Army Corps um, owned and operated breakwater structures that are protecting the Purple Port of Milwaukee facilities. So having good, good resilient protection to that is really important for the city. Um, to the south, Milwaukee County owns a breakwater outside South Shore Park and Marina that extends to the south. That also is, is in need of maintenance and, as well as the, the Army Corps of Engineers properties. So looking, looking at this map, I just started calling people, um, having meetings, showing them my watercolor drawings, which I showed you, uh, fully expecting people to say, this is a really cool idea, but um, you're nuts. <laughs> and that was not what I received as a response. So starting with the Port of Milwaukee, starting with the Environmental Collaboration Office, that's a part of the city of Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin DNR, Milwaukee County, Army Corps of Engineers, everybody kind of said, you know, this is an interesting opportunity. You know, this grant funding, um, the way I was pitching this was sort of phase two of NIFWF's pipeline, which is preliminary design and site assessment. So building off those drawings, uh, doing surveys, figuring out what, we, what can we do that's gonna meet everybody's goals here. And uh, let's see, this project also um, was inspired by what's been called the green breakwater, which is confusing because what I'm talking about would actually look green and this is completely below the surface. Uh, but this was a project that uh, Army Corps was doing maintenance on the Northern section of breakwater. So that, that yellow one, and informed by the work of Dr. John Jansen at UWM Freshwater Sciences, um, incorporated different size cobble and armor stones to encourage expansion of a novel ecosystem that he documented living out there on the breakwater of these invasive hemimysis um, shrimps that are, are living in, inside the breakwater. Nobody knew it was there, nobody thought to look out there. And this was a successful project with Army Corps and their engineering with nature uh, program. That was about 10 years ago. So this kind of builds on that. It set a little bit of a precedent for thinking about ecology and the breakwater structures. Let's see. Yeah, so I had my, my drawings and this is a, it's a two-step application. So I sent in my watercolor drawings and, and was able to get Army Corps and the city and the port to say, yeah, let's, let's look at this. Let's, let's figure out what this could be like two-step application. So for step two, I needed a, a firmer budget, you know, a little more, I got a little more professional looking drawing here um, and a scope of work. So I, I, in talking to Port Milwaukee, Ramble is an engineering company that they have had good success with and came recommended. So I reached out to them and totally on spec, they were able to produce this rendering, help me with a scope and a, a more firm budget and uh, completed the second round of application, which was, was announced it was awarded funding in December, or January, but uh, still working through some, some compliance things. So it's not final yet. So I haven't been able to start work yet, but um, love the opportunity to talk about what we're doing, especially with smart people who are like, oh, have you thought about this? Um, because this is obviously a pretty complicated project. There's that's a lot of fill. It's about 30 feet deep out there. This is a, this is a massive project. So thinking about Cat Island um, and a project I was lucky enough to see last year, Jim Tovey Conservation Area in Mississauga, Ontario, um, adjacent to Toronto, which is sort of like a municipal clean fill um, project that is building up a natural area from the lake bed, which is pretty pretty cool. Uh, so thinking about beneficial reuse as this to make this an opportunity for beneficial reuse would be a strategic way to help make it happen. Um, and just kind of as an overview, the proposal is about $450,000 uh, for that preliminary engineering, which is you know going to include looking at existing reports and evaluations of the breakwater structure, uh, some on the ground or in the water survey. Bathymetry, um, 
plenty of modeling of, of the, the coastal dynamics. And then kind of following Army Corps' process of identifying alternatives, evaluating alternatives, selecting one. Um, I'm gonna work with a project team that includes Chicago District of the Corps, it includes Port Milwaukee, a um, couple other people, Wisconsin GNR to really have a good process. And then bringing that, that selected alternative 45% design with the real goal of figuring out, you know, how can we, how can we do this? How does, how does this work? Let's all get on board. We all think this is a cool idea. Let's develop it and answer a lot of questions, some of which we know and some of which we don't. Um, like we're gonna have to fill, fill the lake bed. So that's a whole Wisconsin process as we all know. Uh, who's gonna own this thing into the future? Um, I have some ideas about who I would like to own it, but we don't we don't have that exactly figured out. So it's the very beginning process of how how do we develop this concept and and get it to a place that everybody's happy with and do something really cool out there in the long term. Um, that's all I have. Thank you, Aaron. That's great. And we have a few minutes for questions. If anyone wants to um, unmute themselves and ask or throw them in the chat. So feel free to um, ask your questions for, for Aaron. Aaron, you may have said this, but what's the timeline you think for getting started on uh, actually implementing? Um, well, we this this sort of phase of of uh, preliminary engineering is probably going to be you know a year and a half to two years, and then okay. we'll we'll do some final design after that. Um, and any construction is you know at least four or five years away, probably. Four or five years away, okay. There's some other big projects like the uh, dredge management materials facility. It's part of the AOC happening here. So there's a mm -hmm. lot there's a lot going on, so. It certainly yeah. seems like it. That's very exciting. Anyone else with a question? I'll put my email in the chat if anybody wants to reach out. Um, happy to happy to chit chat. Great, thanks, Aaron. Um, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for sharing this with us. Yeah, even though uh, you know it's um, still in the works and you're just getting started, um, it's it's very interesting to hear what might be coming down the road. Um, yeah. So, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Yes. Um, with that. I am just going to pop on here and like I mentioned, un, uh, unfortunately, um, Brandon Cromody from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration wasn't able to um, join us today, um, but he did pass along some updates for new and upcoming geospatial data uh, coming out of NOAA that's going to be um, available. And so I just want to quickly go through some of this with you all and share it. Um, so first, NOAA has completed a topobathy LIDAR survey over Washington Island um, and a portion of Door County um, this last summer. And they are hoping to make this data publicly available soon through their um, data access viewer. And um, on the screen here, I just have a, a, a capture of the um, of the data, and um, the this is the new coverage with the pink uh, over the land and the green over the water within this coverage footprint, um, and then the orange line um, you can see outlining here is uh, the area of interest for collection. So this red is, is over the land, green here over the water, and this was their area of interest. So um, they're hoping to get that online soon. They just need to run the data past um, the Wisconsin SHPO uh, prior to public release. And 
If you haven't had the chance or heard of the Data Access Viewer before, this is a, a, a portal um, that NOAA has that includes um, imagery, land cover, and um, elevation and LIDAR data. And so um, they have lots of different layers in here. This is just kind of a, a screenshot of the main screen with the link down here, and you can um, go in and explore all these different types of data. All right. Um, his second update is that NOAA is beginning to update their lake level viewer. And this will be the first major update of the lake level viewer since it was released in 2014. Um, so that's very exciting. The update is going to include a new user interface, um, new water levels, a new coverage area, and new visualizations. So I just have a screenshot here. This is what the um, viewer looks like now when you go in initially. And so they're working on this new interface. So it's going to look different than this if you've used the lake level viewer before. Um, he says that currently NOAA's developers are working on the new coding and the features that are going to show up within this tool now. Um, and he's really, Brandon's really looking forward at coming back to a future call meeting um, and sharing the updated version with us um, once we once they get a, a beta version released. So um, stay tuned for more updates about the Lake Level Viewer down the road. This is gonna be really exciting and I'm interested to see what the new interface looks like. Um, and the last update that Brandon had is that NOAA is working on a high resolution coastal change analysis program or CCAP uh, land cover data set. And it's going to be specifically for the Great Lakes portion of um, Wisconsin. And some of the features of this data set, it's gonna be a one meter spacer, spatial resolution land cover data starting um, with six basic classes initially. Here on the side of the screen, I have a full list of classes um, from this program. Um, and so they're starting with six basic classes to begin with, but um, Brandon says that it will, the CCAP data will be expanded to include the full, um, full classification, classification schema in the future. So this will be coming down the line as well, and hopefully we'll get some updates on that um, down the road. And so um, if you have any major questions, I'd be happy to um, direct them to Brandon, but hopefully we can get him to come back and, and give us some updates on, on these exciting uh, pieces of data. And with that, I'm actually going to pass it off to Jim Gillerano. He's the land information, uh, land information officer for Department of Administration. And um, he'll talk to us a little bit about the Wisconsin Coastal Management Data Infrastructure Project and, and some data as well. So Jim, ready. if you're ready. I'm ready. I'm going to share my screen. Fantastic. And let's see, can you see that? Yes. Oh, goody. Okay, so uh, we've been working on this for several years now with the state cartographer's office using uh, NOAA project does special merit through the coastal program. And our, our main uh, data product has been a, a culvert inventory. And this all started back when we, our, our initial project started in the uh, Lake Superior region where they had all those big storms and folks there were replacing the culverts every other year. And uh, so they got really good at it, but they, they also got really good at uh, collecting uh, information uh, on their culverts in order to, uh, you know, assess the damage and go through the FEMA process and, uh, uh, you know, figure out what they actually needed to uh, uh, change these to, to, to accept more water in the future. So that's where our, our project uh, sort of uh, initiated. And uh, we spent quite a bit of time uh, collecting the, uh, the various uh, uh, data sets up there. 
Uh, we spent quite a bit of time working with uh, uh, field inventory uh, information and uh, uh, getting getting our our feet wet, so to speak, on this this culvert inventory. Now, why is this important? Uh, the culvert is you think of res, you know resiliency uh, as as kind of a, a you know a, a, a food pyramid. And uh, stuff like culvert information is kind of at the base of the pyramid. It's it's the phytoplankton of the of the the GIS world. So this this uh, these culvert uh, data points uh, eventually make their way into various models, whether it's flooding models uh, or uh, things that that we use to to map uh, streams and lakes and wetlands. Uh, but but ultimately uh, they they wind up you know predicting where water flows in, in uh, under under various conditions so it, it's very critical to this this whole food chain uh, that we're able to uh, uh, find these things for one thing and and map them and and build them into to databases so that they are, are able to be used in the future. Um, We've been working quite a bit in the uh, the Lake Michigan area under the COM uh, project. Um, this data viewer that I'm showing you is uh, the culmination of several several uh, months and years of work by the folks at, at the state cartographer's office. And it does not include our, our Lake Michigan data just yet. Um, let's see if I can bring that down here. Oops, where did it go? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, okay. Am I still sharing? Okay. Yes, you are. Uh, okay. So these are the these are the data sets that we've been uh, collecting in the Lake Michigan area, and um, these are uh, you know these are a, a little more detailed in uh, in coverage than those those first data sets. These are uh, these are coming from uh, county road and and land departments, and they include things like driveway culverts and and other uh, other pieces of information. So it's 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 uh, much more detailed. Um, you can see, you know, we're we're getting into the the tribal area here. Uh, you have the United Nation, and um, there's. You know, there's differences in the way folks are collecting this data. So, so we're kind of taking that as is. But uh, hope, hopefully, in the future, this this type of work will will expand uh, to uh, include more more data collection, um, more outreach to these counties that we know have data, but as yet they haven't uh, shared their data with us yet, and. Uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks, we'll try to fill in some of these holes. There is quite a bit of data up here in Oconta and Marinette counties from the Gliski uh, Great Lakes Stream Crossing Inventory, and we haven't we haven't updated that yet. So there's there's a little bit of work to do here. Um, again, we're we're uh, we're trying to do some really really basic uh, data collection here. Um, in, in order to um, uh, make this this make it possible that that other types of mapping will be easier and more cost effective in the future, um, Howard, do you want to say anything about the the culvert vulnerability part? Hi, Jim. Can you folks Hi. hear me? Yes. I'm never <clears throat> I'm never certain. <laughs> I, I will say a couple of words about culvert vulnerability. So this. Um, this is a project that goes back to the original WICD project, which I think started in 2018 or 2019 or something like that. But the idea back then was to try to develop a predictive model that would allow, um, you know, managers in the field to determine which culverts seemed like they were particularly at risk during extreme flood events. You know, not a detailed hydrologic analysis of those culverts, but really more of just a high level planning exercise to say, if you have 27 culverts in your township that you're responsible for, you know, these 
these eight seem like they're the ones that are probably most at risk from, uh, you know, over being over capacity and you know maybe washing out the road or something like that if there was a if there was a flood. So uh, this is something we've been working on for quite a while. We had some <clears throat> staffing changes, and um, we're finally in a position where we think we're very close to uh, such a model. Um, it's based on U.S. Geological Survey of USGS regression equations that predict the um, the peak discharge at a random location um, on a map. Uh, uh, like I said, based on regression equations for different annual exceedance probability events. So 100-year flood, 50-year flood, 25-year flood, things like that. Those um, equations have very recently, like within the last maybe six months, been integrated into an online app called StreamStats that the USGS hosts. Um, so that capability, in effect, uh, allowed us not to have to model those regression equations in our own system. Uh, you can essentially click on that stream stat map, and the result will be essentially a vector of um, discharge amounts in you know cubic meters per second or something like that um, at that for that particular point in the stream network. So what we're working on now is using the API for that uh, software tool to couple that to a culvert uh, uh, capacity model, which you know, fairly simplistically is based on um, something called Manning's equation, which relates to it's a physical uh, model that uh, models flow through a channel like a culvert. And it's based on some pretty specific parameters, but not a lot of them. Uh, including the size of that channel, in other words, you know, the area, the opening of the culvert, um, the slope of that culvert, which determines the rate at which the water will pass through it, and also the roughness of the culvert, which determines how quickly water can flow. So if it's a cement culvert, things can flow more quickly than if it's a corrugated iron culvert, something like that. So we are, I don't know, I guess speaking optimistically, maybe a couple of weeks away from having those two models uh, joined together um, and being able to provide this tool for you know anyone out in the field uh, who has a tablet or on your desktop to do that high level um, that high level prediction of of um, culvert culvert risk. I will say that our definition of culvert vulnerability really is. Um, it really means the culvert has reached capacity. So of course, a culvert can reach and exceed its capacity and still not fail. That's really a much more complicated question that's based on you know, the, uh, the pressure of the water against the embankment where the culvert is located, um, the type of material that is making up the embankment and the roadbed, um, et cetera. So whether or not a culvert will actually be, you know, kind of blown away by a storm is a, a little bit more complicated problem. Um, and this is more of a simple tool to, um, like I said, help, help managers identify uh, those culverts that they need to pay particular attention to and, and maybe have a more advanced hydrologic analysis done to determine um, actual risk. So is that, is that good, Jim? Anything else? Yeah, that, that? yeah I think uh, that covers it. Well, great. Thank you for the update. Um, are there any questions from the audience or Jim or um, for Howard? You can also feel free to throw them in the chat too. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you both. And again, feel free to throw any questions in the chat. Uh, hopefully our speakers are taking a look and um, can answer them for you if anything pops into mind. Um, so next, we are going to be hearing from uh, James Palladori.
James is a water quality and water infrastructure program specialist with the Great Lakes Commission. And he works on various projects to improve uh, the water resources of the Great Lakes region. And that includes preparing drinking water related content for the Blue Accounting Initiative, um, as well as managing the Great Lakes Regional Water Use Database and supporting uh, the development of their blueprint for improving Great Lakes water infrastructure. And so today he's going to share a bit more about that blueprint for improving Great Lakes water infrastructure and their online map for uh, implementation tactics. And so thank you, James, and I'm going to pass it off to you. All right, perfect. Thank you for the introduction, Lydia. All right, great. Um, so thank you, thank you so much for uh, for inviting me to pro to uh, present for this meeting. Uh, like you said, I'll be presenting on the Great Lakes Commission Great Lakes Commission's uh, approaches for improving Great Lakes water infrastructure, um, a blueprint. So to start, I'd like to just give a little background information about what the Great Lakes Commission is and what we do. So the Great Lakes Commission is a binational government agency that was established in 1955 to protect the Great Lakes and the economies and ecosystems they support. Uh, its membership includes leaders from the eight U.S. states and two Canadian provinces uh, within, within the Great Lakes Basin. The GLC recommends policies and practices to, to balance the use, development, and conservation of the water resources of the Great Lakes and helps bring the region together to work on issues that no single community, state, province, or nation can tackle alone. So I was hoping this could uh, provide some context for, for why we were charged with uh, developing this regional blueprint and some background about, about, about what we do. So when we first started developing the blueprint, uh, we received generous uh, funding support from the Joyce Foundation in August uh, 2021. Uh, and GLC staff convened a regional working group to develop this blueprint to tackle the region's significant water infrastructure needs. Uh, as work progressed, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act was signed into law in the United States, uh, making the blueprint an even more timely guide for the region. Uh, and I've included this graph here. Hopefully these numbers aren't, aren't too small here, um, but a significant portion of, uh, refer to it as the IIJA, uh, funding was for water infrastructure and went to drinking water and clean water state revolving funds. Uh, and several blueprint approaches, which I'll discuss later, uh, focus on the revolving funds as these programs are the main vehicle uh, for water infrastructure funding uh, distribution through the IIJA and provide large investments in water infrastructure improvements. Um, and hopefully, as you can see here, due to the large increase in SRF funding through the IIJA, uh, there are several opportunities to adapt and expand the reach and impact of both clean water and drinking water SRF programs that are identified throughout the blueprint. Um, so you can see a lot of, in each state, in the region, you can see that SRF funding between fiscal year 21 and 22 has essentially doubled. Uh, and more than that in most cases for the drinking water specific um, state revolving fund. So we wanted to make sure that, that this money was being used in the right places and made sure to incorporate that uh, within the blueprint. Additionally, in October of 2021, Great Lakes Commission commissioners passed a policy resolution promoting climate resilience in the basin and specifically called for the GLC to engage this working group to incorporate resiliency in the development of the blueprint. So that is an overarching theme include, included throughout the blueprint and I'll explain uh, exactly what that is uh, a little bit later. So for some further background on who the regional working group was, um, the GLC worked with diverse partners and stakeholders to identify approaches for improving water infrastructure within the region. Uh, and our goal was to have representation across sectors and throughout the entire Great Lakes region. So the group com was comprised of stakeholders from several sectors, such as academic institutions, nonprofits, uh, advocacy and activist organizations, government agencies, and elected officials to ensure that we had the broadest perspective possible. The regional working group developed a common understanding of water infrastructure problems and outlined approaches to help set the stage for progress throughout the blueprint. So the working group considered several questions 
Um, the first of which being who should participate to reflect the needs and information representative of the Great Lakes Basin residents. What are the shared challenges and what steps can help address them? And how do we ensure that approaches are equitable and further strengthen the region's resiliency to a changing climate? Um, in this graphic here, we, we like to use, I, I think it's uh, pretty cute and, and representative of uh, what we aim to do with the blueprint. So this shows this first step as being convening state and provincial and local partners to help build a common understanding of uh, condition, baseline conditions and, and basin-wide challenges relating to water infrastructure. Um, and with the second step being share the blueprint with Great Lakes leaders, which is part of what I'm currently doing with this presentation, uh, but uh, includes briefings on the blueprint, um, infra infographics and fact sheets, um, as well as potential blue accounting efforts. Um, and our outcome is, uh, or our, our proposed and, and hoped for outcome is uh, better investment in Great Lakes water infrastructure uh, that's in alignment with the regional blueprint. So working towards finalizing the blueprints, um, once the working group had developed the, bl the blueprint, excuse me, it went through several phases of public outreach and stakeholder engagement. This included a listening session that we held last summer that was open to the public. Uh, and we also held a session at the One Water Summit hosted by the US Water Alliance last September to, to garner feedback from some members of the uh, professional water industry. Uh, we also had an online portal to, to get public feedback as well. Um, and then Great Lakes Commissioners uh, approved the blueprint during their annual meeting in October of 2022, um, finalizing it and allowing us to use it in our, uh, our further outreach uh, for the blueprint. Um, so then we moved on to calls and discussions with stakeholders who are uh, engaging in activities to implement these approaches with the blueprint. Um, and again, I will uh, get to that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but so for now, we can get to the actual content of the blueprint. So for the, for the purposes of the blueprint, uh, we refer to water infrastructure as encompassing services related to drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater. Uh, and the goal was uh, to consider water infrastructure as a system of interconnected services. So, so while these services have historically been managed and regulated separately, uh, we're hoping to see them holistically and we're hoping that that shows through in the, uh, in the blueprint. So the blueprint is organized by four priority areas developed by the working group to help advance water infrastructure impl improvements in the Great Lakes Basin. Each priority area is then broken down into layers, uh, which I will explain in further detail in the next slide. So our fundamental goals with the blueprints um, include our articulating approaches for rebuilding the basin's water infrastructure in a manner that addresses historic inequities in water infrastructure investment and prepares the basin for future uh, climate conditions. So both of these overarching themes are present throughout the entire blueprint, uh, and our aim is to have them considered in each approach. Uh, so what do I mean when I say layers? So we developed um, each priority area to be further organized into layers, depending on who we are targeting and what uh, mechanisms we are hoping to use with each approach. So the first layer is what we call a framing layer. So this refers to the state and regional agency support systems, along with the local planning and prioritization efforts that are informed by meaningful community input. We also have the, the financing layer, which refers to the funding mechanisms overseen by the federal government and implemented by states. Then the finishing layer includes improvements implemented by local governments, utilities, and communities with or in partnership with uh, affected communities, ensuring clear two-way communication of objectives and anticipated benefits. So each of the priority areas are, are separated by each of these three layers. Um, and so by priority areas, these are the four that were developed by the regional working group. Uh, the first being public health and safety, um, so these, these two things, public health and safety, are our core tenets of each of the other priority areas, but it, it 
it was worth including it as its own priority area. Um, so whether through the supply of safe drinking water, the collection of, or treatment of sewage, or the management of stormwater, public health and safety is a central purpose of federal and state funding for water infrastructure systems. Uh, the next priority area is community engagement and trust building. So at its core, water infrastructure exists to meet the needs of people. And so this priority area shares approaches that leaders may deploy to ensure water infrastructure project, projects address the needs of all people especially those who have historically been excluded from the benefits of infrastructure investment or who experience disproportionate water stresses. The third priority area is the equitable distribution of investments and benefits. So they, the working group acknowledged that the need for uh, water infrastructure investment in the Great Lakes Basin spans across the region's states, affecting urban centers, rural areas, and the suburban expanse in between. Uh, so this approach focus, uh, excuse me, this, this priority area focuses on approaches uh, to ensure that the federal and state funds are equitably distribution, distri distributed, excuse me, uh, to ensure tangible benefits to the basin citizens, regardless of their zip code. And finally, our last priority area deals with asset management and workforce development. So while much of the Great Lakes Basin's expansive water infrastructure system is buried and out of sight, Numerous water professionals are keeping watch over the myriad pumps, pipes, plants, and basins uh, relied on for water services. Skilled workers and infrastructure systems are aging, putting additional strain on the region's water infrastructure system. So this priority area focuses on asset management as a holistic program to plan for the future that includes the development of the next generation of water professionals. Um, so I have a link to the blueprint here. So I'd like to, um, just kind of show you exactly how this uh, how this is laid out. Are you able to to see the blueprint? Um, it, it, not popping up. There we go. All right. You make sure you're able to see that. Um, so this is a copy of our blueprint here that provides some some background and information on the layers. Um, but when here is exactly how it's laid out. So we have each priority area that is then separated by layer into framing, financing, and finishing layers. And each of these bullets are what we refer to as approaches. So I'd like to just call um, call out a few examples of of approaches here that are included in the blueprint. So for public health and safety, we have the approach to incorporate climate forecasts and natural infrastructure into traditional approaches for managing water and preventing flooding. So if we move down to the second priority area, which is community engagement and trust building, again, this is separated into each layer, uh, each with their varying approaches. Uh, and each approach has a varying level of specificity, some targeting um, specific level of government, such as local, state, or federal, um, and some targeting utilities, with some being a very general approach that can be applied to all levels of decision makers. Um, so one approach from, from this priority area is to ensure that all levels of government and utilities prioritize and make planning decisions with a community rather than for a community. So this is an overarching, um, more general uh, approach that applies to all um, stakeholders and decision makers being targeted in the blueprint. Um, so I just wanted to to give you a chance to to kind of see how exactly this is laid out, since we have some specific specific lingo with uh, priority areas and each layer and what we mean by approaches. All right, are you able to see my slides again? Yes. Great. No troubles with that one. All right, so that brings me to um, the kind of next phase in our project, which is this regional implementation tactic dynamic map. So Great Lakes Commission staff recognize that while the regional working groups listing of approaches may be helpful, the impact of the work will be strengthened by ongoing identification of implementation tactics or success stories. And that means the organizations, governments, util and utilities putting the blueprint approaches into practice. So to share how the Great Lakes community has put these blueprint approaches into action, uh, the GLC is collecting implementation tactics uh, from 
these utilities, uh, state agencies, governments, and other organizations throughout the region. The dynamic map displays a description of each tactic, a point of contact, and a link to more information to provide examples of success stories uh, for other stakeholders to follow and for other governments throughout, throughout the region to use as examples to consider when distributing funds for water infrastructure. Um, so implementation tactics and success stories have been gathered by Commission staff to develop a new online portal for engaged decision makers to view how appro approaches in the blueprint are being implemented around the basin. So the portal, or the dynamic map rather, uh, is currently maintained by GLC staff, but will soon be made available uh, for public input, input of information to hopefully be, be crowdsourced and include more and more implementation tactics uh, as more people are familiar with it and include uh, their own success stories. So I'd like to pull up the, the mapper for a moment. Uh, is this showing up okay? Yep, we can see it. Perfect. Um, so this includes the implementation tactics that we have currently gathered. Um, and this shows uh, each tactic by layer. So we have the framing, financing, and finishing layer. So this is currently showing all the tactics that we have for the framing layer. So you can scroll through the map and see the, the points where there are currently implementation tactics. And if you click on one, it will show you the organization's name, the implementation tactic um, or their success story, a, a brief description of that tactic, the primary blueprint priority area and the layer that it corresponds to, uh, the scope, so state and regional or local, um, as well as a point of contact name, email, and a link for more information that will take you to their site relating back to their implementation tactic. Um, so you can you can click on each individual point on the map, or you can go over to the side and scroll through each one this way. And then if you go through to the financing tab, you'll see that we have other implementation tactics. Uh, throughout the region that correlate to the um, to the financing layer. So relating specifically to the Calm Network, we have the uh, Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District, um, whose implementation tactics is their climate resilience incentive programs that include various green infrastructure and natural infrastructure programs. Um, and again, we have our point of contact, uh, their email, and a link for more information. Uh, so this is what we've been working on to uh, to help showcase the work that's been going on in the region uh, and how organizations are currently implementing the blueprint. So if your organization is implementing blueprint approaches, um, feel free to email me and my email is up on the screen there. And I believe we have a poll set up to uh, just gauge some of the work that uh, that you and your organizations may be doing. Yes, Hannah, would you mind launching the poll? So this asks you if you or your organization is currently implementing a blueprint approach. Um, and I understand you, you probably have not had enough time to read through the blueprint or their approaches. Um, but if, if you believe you are, which priority area best aligns with your approach? Thank you so much, Lydia. Um, and thank you all for, uh, for participating in the poll. Um, so again, if, uh, if you are implementing any blueprint approaches, or if you'd like any further information, or if you'd like more time to, to look through the blueprint, uh, again, please email me. So I'd like to again say thank you to our funder for this project, the Joyce Foundation. Um, they have been a huge help throughout this process, um, and we're super happy with the, uh, the product that we have now. So I'd like to take a moment to open it up for questions and thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to present on the blueprint and our mapper. Yeah, thank you, James. Um, feel free to unmute and ask a question or put it in the chat. Um, we're monitoring there and we can, we can call it out.
All right. Well, James's contact information is in there. Um, so feel free to reach out to him. Um, we do have a, a couple extra minutes. If there were questions for any of the presenters at this time, um, uh, I'll give you a minute to type them in the chat or call them out um, for, for Katie and Scott, for Aaron, um, Jim or Howard. Um, feel free to, to ask them now um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Okay, well, thank you guys um, so much for joining us. I just wanna give a big thank you to um, our speakers this morning. Um, a lot of great presentations and we really appreciate you joining us today. Um, the recording of this meeting will be uh, available online um, on the Wisconsin Coastal Resilience website in, in the blog where we have our meetings and um, uh, like field trip summaries. So, um, I'll also send out a blast to everybody with the recording, um, and that should be probably available late, late next week. Um, and I just want to go back to um, the slides that I was sharing with the network goals at the beginning of the meeting um, and talk about this third goal that we have here, this regional prioritization of hazards to address through collaborative action. Um, so our summer meeting will be coming up most likely in June. And I know that this meeting was full of presentations, um, but we're planning for a very interactive summer meeting um, where we can really talk with each other and work together um, to start prioritizing which hazards uh, or which coastal challenges um, we want to address as a region. Um, we've been doing that for the last 18 months, but now we're gonna get it, uh, get it down in writing um, and then start identifying some actions to address them collaboratively. So we're working on what that's gonna look like, but um, it should be a really interesting meeting um, and a great opportunity to connect with one another. Um, and so just a reminder that we send out the Coastal Resilience newsletter um, monthly. So if you have anything that you wanna share with the network, project updates, um, lessons learned from, from things you've been working on, um, requests for information or input, anything like that, feel free to contact me and we can get it in the newsletter so that others in the network can see what's going on in between meetings. Um, We've also got a lot of great information that comes out there, funding opportunities, training events, um, and case studies. So uh, if you're not signed up for the newsletter and you'd like to be, feel free to let me know or um, go to the contact us page on the website and, and enter um, your information there. Um, otherwise, I just wanna say thanks for joining us. We're really excited to continue to find opportunities to share tools, resources, case studies and, and funding opportunities with the network. Um, and especially looking to leverage the work that you guys are doing, um, your experiences, your expertise, and um, showcase that here. So thank you for that. And thank you for joining us. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions and have a great weekend.